Hey guys, welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast. We're here to help you establish your author brand, build a fan base, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker. I'm here with uh, Jeffrey Poole and Joe Lalo. And tonight we're going to be talking just amongst ourselves about what each of us does when it's time to launch a new book. And, um, you know, we, we have about 30 novels or more between us, so hopefully we kind of know what we're talking about. But uh, we'll, we'll definitely get some more guests on in the future after the holidays and uh, pump them for information too. But uh, So, hey guys, what's going on and what have you been up to this week? Let's, let's banter before we get into the professional stuff. <laughs> Well, as for me personally, I'm approaching the end of my uh, line to finish my, uh, good God, uh, sixth book, <laughs> uh, A Portal for Your Thoughts. That's my Tales of Lentari book number three. And I've got just a couple of chapters left. And, and my, my, the way my editing process is, as soon as I finish the chapter, I will give it to the nice, lovely lady just in the other room there, have her read it. And then once she gives it back to me with all kinds of pretty little color marks on it saying, you need to fix this, then I'll progress to the next chapter there. But I, I've been working on I'm approaching the finish line. And I'm about, I've, say, I've contacted the cover artist. I just need to figure out what I want to put on the cover. Because my deadline, I have vowed to myself, I will get this freaking book out by the end of the year so for me that'd be two and it's a huge improvement so I know for you guys you release quicker than that but for me I'm, I'm trying for two so it'll make it cool and um, the lovely lady is your wife right not somebody you kidnapped off the street or something like that <laughs> yes that would be my wife alright cool oh, I hope you get it out before I'm uh, gonna shoot for you before Christmas get a big launch there I'm trying I'm gonna really gonna try alright I got. Um, I just got my edited novel, my manuscript back for for the release I'm doing on December 18th, which I'm sure we'll be talking about today. So I need to go through that after Thanksgiving. I also, not book related, was working on. We have to brine a turkey because we're hosting Thanksgiving this year. So I'm I'm fretting about how quickly a turkey can defrost and whether or not you can safely put it in a five gallon bucket uh, for brining purposes. You just and, put it in the uh, microwave, don't you, for like a couple hours? For like for like five hours, it'll be all right. <laughs> and uh, what else? Uh, NaNoWriMo technically is still going, and I hit my word count like a week or more ago, but the plot keeps going. I, I, I have this endless climax going. I didn't write a word today because it was all Thanksgiving prep, but in, I got five more days to, to call it a plot, I feel like. So that's what I'm working on in my life. Yeah, I actually had the same thing with NaNoWriMo. I did 100,000 words, and I was like, I either have to end this here or, because I had a whole bunch more stuff plotted out to happen in this first book. I was like, this book one is going to be like 170,000 words, so hopefully it ends in a good place and has a nice climax and people will like it and want to buy the second one. So we'll see. <laughs> it's the problem with epic fantasy. Yeah, it just keeps going. <laughs> but anyway, oh, excuse me. Why don't we jump into the interview process here? We're going to kind of do a round robin where... Uh, we each take turns interviewing each other, and if we had live viewers, we'd invite you guys to uh, to jump in with questions, but uh, I'm pretty sure we're not that sophisticated yet, but we are almost up on iTunes. It's this close. For those of you listening, I was holding my fingers together, and they were close. But uh, first, I, I'm going to start out uh, interviewing Jeff about his, uh, his books and what he's doing for launches, what he's done in the past, and uh, what he's going to be doing for this new book next month. So, um, hey Jeff, why don't you tell me, uh, let's go back to the beginning and uh, tell us how things first started out for you. What, what did you do back in uh, 2010 or whatever it was back there? <clears throat> well, for that one, that would have been Bakken Chronicles Book 1, which was the prophecy. And at that point in time, yeah, well, see, that was, I think it's September of 2010. Well, I didn't even know I was going to publish the thing until about, oh, July of 2010. My wife actually convinced me to, uh, to go ahead and publish it. And I didn't really do any advertising. I really didn't do anything. I just wanted to see if if the description I wrote and the cover I made was even remotely interesting enough to someone to go, hmm, I'll give that a try. And oddly enough, to my, from my mind's eye anyway, oddly enough, it's you know, it, it didn't download too many times. It didn't make that many sales. But it was enough for people to tell me, oh, yeah, it's a good. When's number two coming out? I was like, well, 
it took me 10 years to write the first one, so we're looking at probably 2020. But no, it's just once I had enough people downloading it and inquiring about it, that's when I really started focusing on number two. But for marketing-wise, I tell you the honest truth, I really didn't do a darn thing because that was my first book, and I wasn't too sure how people were going to like it. If everyone hated it, then I was like, okay, I'm going to scrap this whole writing idea <laughs> and move on to something else or stick with the computer tech stuff. There, But people seem to like it, so I kept going. Yeah, that's cool that you got some uh, readers right off the bat. Was that 2010? That was a while ago, right? Yeah, that was tw that was 2010. Yep. Yeah, I think that most people will, and I'm going to talk about my pen name thing later. But most people today will say it's a little harder to get noticed in the Kindle store. I remember when I got started too. It used to be like, take one book to make it to 40,000 or something in your sales ranking, one sale the day, something like that. It's a little different <laughs> yeah. now. I, I remember what I did is as soon as I released you know, the prophecy, I actually started looking around because I noticed Amazon at the time, I, I think they still do, but at the time they really had some strong forums in there where you know authors could actually go and kind of talk about other books, what they're interested in, see if anyone's looking for like a new fantasy and say, hey, you know, how about mine? This is what it's about. And I came across a couple of people that uh, R. M. Putnam, Rose Putnam. She actually, you know, has her own you know, series of, of fantasy, kind of like dark horror type stories there. But she's her little message posting said, "Looking to read you know, new authors, new fantasy, and if you've got a book you want me to read, and as long as it's under five bucks, I'll go ahead and buy it." I'm like, really? Okay, and she said she'd leave a review and everything. So I was so stoked when I got my first review. I'm like, I was pretty much strutting around my house. Look at this. I got a review. She liked it. Five stars. And that came crashing down when I, as soon as I got my first one star, but it happens. But uh, it, it's one of those things there where I, I, I had you know, more and more people started taking an, an interest in it. And, and I saw somewhere that it said, you know, if you know, if, if put something at the end of the book, like author notes type of thing, where if you say, oh, you really like the book, you know, do me a favor, help me out, like leave a review, or if you hated it, I'm a big boy, just tell me what you didn't like, that's okay, you're not going to hurt my feelings, just go ahead and you know, put them, leave a review anyways, and as soon as I did that, and the reviews started piling up, and apparently people really like, you know, the indie authors, they like the idea of people being, you know, published by themselves traditionally, I mean, um, just by themselves without doing the traditional method, so it, it worked well, as soon as I put that little thing in the back of the book there, I just started getting reviews left and right, most of them good. Yeah, I think it's really true that people want to find gems amongst the indie authors, and uh, I think they also like the accessibility when you have your email and you invite people to talk with you in the back of the book, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for me personally, was I didn't even really look, give indie authors like the benefit of a doubt until I actually became one. And as soon as I did, I was like, you know what? Now my, you know, my readership is picking up. I'm getting fans left and right. Why don't I start looking at some of the indie readers or indie authors myself and see what I can find? And I found some some really good authors out there that are just some were absolutely hysterical, some needed more editing. I mean, it just I mean, there were some really good writers out there. Yes, there's not some risks or some <laughs> questionable ones, but most of them are, are doing pretty good, just trying to get their books you know, out there. So that's where you now we we did the you know the bundling thing there. A couple other people that I met that did a really good job. So I was just proud to be one of them. For sure, and um, I would say too to people that I remember those Amazon forums, and they used to be a little friendlier. I think now you'll probably Much get chased out with pitchforks. <laughs> I've heard of people being banned if you self-promote, so I wouldn't recommend really. No, I mean, it, if you're really a, yeah, if you're really just into the subject and you want to participate, that's good. I think you can have your books over in your Amazon profile, and people can check it out. But uh, yeah, as far as promotion, I don't know about that <laughs> now. Yeah, I mean, it got to the point where I literally was banned from the forums for a little bit because the only thing I did, which apparently is against the rules there, but after my name every single time, I just put www.lentari.com, just, you know, the, what my website, so people can actually find me a little bit easier to look it up. <clears throat> apparently, the, excuse me, apparently that was a no-no, <laughs> and I got my tail kicked right out of there, and it wasn't until I actually, it was like three, four months later, I had to get on the phone after I tracked down the, the right department to get myself reinstated, that's like, you know what, <clears throat> all right, I know it now, I've lesson learned, let me back in, they're like, all right, here you go, so, <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah, I think they went a little overboard, because I remember about a year or two ago, uh, you know how uh, you actually get your own forum or people can ask questions, forum questions at the end of your books or your author page or whatever it is. I asked, I answered somebody's question about like when is the next book coming out and my post got deleted. They're like, no self-promotion. <laughs> but it was on my author page. <laughs> yep. But, um, anyway, so what does a, a book launch look, for, look like for you these days? 
Well, now it's got to the point where I'll, I'll start, you know, I'll start you know, talking to the fans on the Facebook saying, guess what? You know, I'm really, really close here because usually they know when I put out the call for beta readers that, that you know, I'm getting ready to release one. I'll put it all over the blog. <clears throat> I haven't really done like, like paid advertising sort of thing, but I'm seriously contemplating it now. Just whether the what, what was it, Joe, the book bub, something like that, or the I'm thinking about maybe doing like a Facebook advertising there, just to see, you know, just kind of help to get the word out there. But I have enough people asking about it now. Where they're, how about now? It's like a kid in a car. How about now? How about now? You ready now? You gonna release it now? How about now? <laughs> I can't just spit these things out. It takes a little bit of time, or else I'm gonna get one with all kinds of errors in it, and I'll get crucified on the reviews. So, but uh, but nowadays, you know, to me now, I, I let the fans know I, I haven't really messed too much with the mailing list, but I'm gonna set one of those up because I hear nothing but good stuff about you know just kind of like a little newsletter where I only I don't really you know, I probably won't do it like once a week or anything. So maybe once a month, saying here's what I've been working on. You know, I'm here's the date I'm shooting for. And if you're looking for a, an excerpt, I just posted one on the blog. That sort of thing. So I, I'm I'm looking to increase it this particular time around so I'm I'm more open for suggestions so right yeah definitely a mailing list is a good idea uh, just because it really helps if you can get everybody that's your fan to know your book is out that particular day and go out and buy it in the first week uh, especially if you're maybe starting a new series and you're hoping that people will jump in that have never heard of you before might see it right. in the charts or something like that but um yeah so uh, do you do anything to try to get more reviews? Like, do you send out advanced review copies or anything like that to get reviews that first week? Um, with one of the one of the you know, my, I think my second book, maybe the third one there, I did that where I could see if I can actually get you know more and more people interested. In it. I, I'm really proud to be able to say this, but I don't have to do that right now. As soon as those things are out, I've got such a devoted legion of fans there that as soon as the thing's out, they know that the good reviews help. If they did, if they found something they didn't like, typically the beta readers would crucify me again. So they, as soon as I release the book and they're able to read it, they usually start leaving the reviews like almost instantly. Last time I did it for something Wyverian, I think I had my first good review like about five hours after I officially hit publish on Amazon. I don't know how they did it so fast, but they must not have done anything else. But, hey, I'm not arguing. Yeah, it's really great when you've got a series like that with a loyal following. And I've experienced that, too, with my Emperor's Edge books. You know, I usually say in the back, I'm like, hey, a reviews really help. So if you could post one, yeah, that would be I, great. I always put, yeah, I always put that now that it's just standard. I put the author's note back there saying, hey, you know, thanks for reading the books. I appreciate you as a fan. Uh, once again, if you want to help me out as an indie author, wherever you bought the book at, feel free to leave me a review, good or bad. It doesn't really matter. Any review literally can help an author out. So. And ever, ever since I started including that at the end of the books, I have had no problems getting reviews for them. Great. Do you think you would uh, change anything if you were to like start a new series that wasn't tied into your other ones to encourage people to cross over or new people to try them? The, the only thing I would be concerned about is because I, I encountered this when I actually, because the Bakken Chronicles, that was only the three books. And as soon as I decided to keep my, my Lantari books open, I actually created the new series, Tales of Lantari, and when I first released Lost City, which was my fourth book, I noticed the sales weren't nearly as great because I and I had people mentioning in the reviews, ah, oh, I love the you know the Amulet of Aria, you know the Bucking Chronicles three. Too bad, you no, know, he doesn't keep this series going. And as me on the other end of my screen going, what do you mean I'm not keeping the series going? I've got it right there. So I would be definitely. You know, encouraging people to, if they're going to do something like that, let the readers know. So at this point, I actually started putting little blurbs at the back of the book saying, okay, you know, adventures continue. Check out this book here. Free, you know, I'll keep reading to read like the first chapter of this particular book, and hopefully you can get them hooked that way too. And that actually seemed to work once I did that, because that's when the number of sales for Lost City increased when I put it on the end of the, essentially the previous series. Yeah, it definitely makes sense to to let them know <clears throat> let them know right in the book because, you know, I always feel like there's a good group of people on Facebook and Twitter, but I have to remember that there's a lot of other people who enjoy the books and will look for you on Amazon, but aren't necessarily following your every move from day to day and don't know what you're working on. Yeah, because I can't speak for everyone, but when I'm reading a book on my iPad or you know, whatever, I get to, I'll keep swiping that screen until eventually I can't swipe anymore. So if by chance there's author notes, there's acknowledgments, there's whatever that's back there, I like looking at it just to see what's back there. Because typically most people put some sort of an author's note back there that says, hey, you enjoy reading the books? Maybe you should consider looking at this. And I've done that for other times for other author friends of mine that says, hey, if you like my books, you'll 
check out so and so and he does the same thing if you like my books check out Jeffrey Poole's books you know Bucking Chronicles and all that so it, it helps a lot for sure uh, have you ever put excerpts for the next book in the back of the previous book mm -hmm. I yeah. have, uh, quite a few times yeah that's that's usually what I end up doing is uh, Especially, especially when I switch series there, or not really switch, but I change the name of the series there, is just to let them know. I'll say, okay, I'll keep reading for a sneak peek or an exclusive look. You know, however I can fluff that thing up to make it sound really intriguing, let them keep reading. And there's a lot of people like myself. When you're reading a book, you kind of keep an eye on the pages left, sort of thing. So when you wrap up a book and you glance down there and you still have, say, a hundred, you know, digital pages to go, you're like. Did they do back here? Is you know, they it's like a sneak peek of something else? You know, is it some sort of a glossary, appendices? You, you never know. So I always like to keep an eye on that just to see when I actually hit the end of the book there too. That way I don't miss anything. All right, sounds like a good plan. Uh, so it sounds like you're not quite using the newsletter yet, but uh, I know you're active on social media. What kind of things do you do on Facebook? And I don't know if you're on Twitter or Google uh, around your book launch. Uh, usually what I end up doing is probably, uh, I would say like a week, couple weeks before I'm officially ready to do it. Because usually by the time it's in the beta reader's hands or the editor or whatnot, then I'll be like, that's when I start you know, talking about people like, oh, just asking just real simple questions like, okay, well, just questions about the books. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, what was your favorite scene from here? You know, like, if you were going to be a dragon, what would you like to look like? Or if you're going to be a, a, an exotic creature in my kingdom there, what would you like to be? Just get people talking about it and then go, oh, by the way, that's when they start asking me, you know, when's the next book coming out? Because as soon as I get their interest up, they start asking about it. And I can say, well, you're in here. Good luck, good timing. You know, here in about the next week or so, I should have the next one done. And they were like, oh, fantastic. Can't wait to read it. So that's where the newsletter, I should have done this a while ago, but the newsletter kicks in. So as soon as I get that thing done, I can send out a mail blast to everybody that says, it's here. You know, help me spread the word. You know, and, and usually, though, the fans I've got on Facebook will do just that. Or just, so. Just make sure. Me and, about uh, newsletter. I was like, the newsletter. I'm like, Man, I <laughs> seriously should have done that a while ago. So. <laughs> well, this, if nothing else, this podcast will make us all like try to do the things the other people are doing and, and uh, maybe pressure you into finishing more books or getting more out there or something. I don't know. I'm trying. We'll, we'll pretend it's a mastermind group and we'll let people listen in. But, um, have you done anything, uh, I assume you're aware, aware like, of your book's sales ranking and uh, where it places in categories. Have you done anything as part of a launch or uh, to try to get older books into the categories to be in the top 100 for more visibility or do you have any strategies to, to make it stay there for longer after the first couple of days? Well, what I've noticed is uh, something I actually keep an, a real serious eye on is yeah, I, I will notice that whenever the book actually hits one of those, let's see, let's say if I have got it for whatever reason, it shows up fantasy, swords and sorcery, and kingdoms or whatever really obscure you know categories they have there. I'm like, okay, that's great, and I'll keep an eye on it. As soon as it vanishes from that category, I'll go ahead and change the category. It's like, okay, well instead of you know, fa let's see, fantasy epic, let's try you know, you know fantasy you know historical, or let's switch over to fantasy general. Or if it's something that remotely has sci-fi in it, I'll I'll switch one of the categories over to sci-fi. Uh, see sci-fi action and adventure. I mean, just just to kind of you know, I'll tweak it every couple of days to see when it actually hits another set of charts. I'll leave it there for a while, and then as soon as it vanishes from the charts again, I'll just keep bumping around to see which combination works the best. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I've I've definitely heard of people doing that when they do a big promotion, or like most of the time they might find that it's they do they get more visibility by being in some small category. Like maybe I would be in steampunk. And uh, but then if they get a book bub ad or something really big where they know pretty much guaranteed to get a bunch of sales in a certain period of time, then they'll jump over to like epic fantasy or something that's uh, mm -hmm. has more people checking it out, but is also more competitive to show up in. Exactly. But um, I guess that's about all my questions for you. Uh, I would like to hear Joe comment too on uh, what he does to stay in those categories and <laughs> try to increase visibility, especially since he's been uh, he's had his book of Deacon there for off and on in epic fantasy for like four years. But I'm going to let you do the interviewing for him, and I'll shut up now for a little while. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, well, Joe, I th I th we were talking about it briefly before we hit the live there. Okay. 
you just mentioned to me earlier that you created the, your release date for uh, you know de December for this next one that you're at there. Um, and obviously, is this is that something you plan out in advance that often, or you, I think you mentioned that you only have done this a couple of times now. What are the pros and cons for doing something like that? Well, um, yeah, in the past, what I would do with the release is I would finish the book and then I would schedule the release for, say, a month or two months later so that because I wouldn't know when it was done. I would wait until the book was absolutely finished before I set a date, and then the date would be a couple months later, so that I would have a couple of months to ramp up and make people aware that it was going to be coming out. The last two books I pre-ordered, and uh, uh, the benefits I, like the benefits are different for different places. Pre-orders on a uh, Apple and Kobo and Barnes and Noble apparently they count as day one sales. So if you get 200 pre-orders over the course of a, a six-month period, and then the book releases, it's like it got 200 day one sales, which gives you a huge rate uh, uh, rank spike. So that's useful there. Uh, and on Amazon, I'm told that doesn't happen, that the ranking is, you know, it, it, each sale counts as a sale, a pre-order pre counts as a sale on that day, but you don't get the money until the launch, and they can't download it to the launch. So it's less apparent what its, bon its bonus is to, to pre-order on Amazon, but you can do a few things. You can test your cover, you can test your blurbs, and you can be absolutely certain that it releases that day because in the past I've attempted to have the books all go live at the same time, which is relatively easy for EverPlace but Amazon because EverPlace but Amazon gets it through Smashwords, and Smashwords had pre-orders for longer. So you could you could set it up like that. But Amazon used to take like three days to get your book out, and now it takes like eight hours to get your book out. So trying to nail it so that it shows up at the same time as everything else is really tricky. With a pre-order, you can make everything show up at the same time. And uh, that's that's really... It, I suppose, for, for Amazon's bonuses. Although we'll find out, this is the first Amazon pre-order I ever did because it wasn't available to me until recently. Is it hard to set up an Amazon pre-order? Because I know how to do it with a Smashwords. Because you, I mean, you, I've, since I did it with that that uh, Fantasy 101 that I'm part of, but you know, what's involved with it creating a, a, a release date with Amazon? It used to, well, again, it's, it's a new edition, but basically it's just a little radio box. It's like, is this going to be published now or is it going to be published Is a future date? And then you choose the future date, and you make darn sure you hit that date because they warn you if you don't have your finished manuscript in place by 10 days before your release date, then you aren't allowed to pre-order again for a year. So Jeez. it's very simple to set up. It really is just one little choice. You choose, yes, this will be done later, and this is when it will be done. And then it changes all of your options from that point. It becomes very self-explanatory. You update. If you have a temporary manuscript, you put it in there. There's a little there's a little box that says, this is now my final manuscript, which I guess would allow them to start using it for uh, excerpts and stuff. So it's pretty simple. But again, there's consequences if you don't do it correctly. Okay, so, so here's a good question for you then. It, let's say in your case you set up the release date for December 18th of next, next month, and let's say the 1st of December rolls around, you're going, there is no way in heck you're going to be able to meet that date. Can you go in there and push that date forward? Is there like, kind of like hotel reservations where you've got up to a certain amount of time before you can change the date, before you get dinged? I haven't tried it, and I don't know what the options are, but I've been told you more or less have to have an Amazon rep for that. I mean, like, oh. Amazon, I, I, I think that you might be able to set it to, to go live early, but I'm pretty sure Amazon does not give you the, the, the turnkey possibility to move your data out because I guess it's a bait and switch for the fans that way. So, yeah, I've heard you need special permission to change your, uh, your launch date. Hmm. Good to know. When you're getting ready to, uh, say, you've finished your, your writing your book there, obviously you use beta readers. How many beta readers do you typically use? Uh, I, I do usually a couple of rounds of beta readers. I have my friends. I have two friends who, who read my, my stuff, so they'll, they'll be first. Sometimes first, I, don't, I won't wait for them to give me my stuff back, but they'll get it before anyone else. And then after that, I have got three more beta readers that are sort of my second round, and usually you're just a few days later just to give me a chance to maybe make it a little bit prettier before I send it to them. And then I might have a couple more after that. depends on who's available and who's interested. But So typically somewhere between five and eight beta readers, but the, it, broken up between friends and fans. Nice. Okay. 
Okay, have you ever had to veto some suggestions made by the, the beta readers? For instance, if like say two or three of them both say the same thing, like what would be better, or it doesn't make sense for this person to say that, and and you going, no, that's important. I want that to stay. You all can kiss my tail. It's staying put. Yeah, there's been there's been uh, there's been a couple of times where uh, I got I have one beta reader in particular, one of my friends. He's very blunt. He has no filter. I don't have to worry about him saying that it's good just because he's trying to make me feel good. He will, you know, and he'll nitpick on some very small things. He'll be like, "Well, I don't understand how that guy could have somebody, you know, like something wrapped around the back of his neck and then he falls down and it comes off." And we will argue for an hour about, "No, no, he falls. The loop goes up over the back of his head and it's okay. He falls. He runs away. It's fine." And and I'm like, okay, the heck with you. You don't understand physics. It's staying in. That sort of stuff will happen all the time. But the converse has happened too. I have a book that I have not released. It is an entire book and half of another book that was going to be the unnamed second trilogy. Uh, and uh, I haven't released it because I had a character that I didn't like, and I've given it to a lot of beta readers. And... Four out of five beta readers were like, oh, no, that's fine. You should leave it in. That's an excellent character. And I'm like, no, nope, I don't agree with you. This book isn't going out until I'm happy with that character. So it's gone both ways where, where I disagreed with beta readers and, and where I, you know, where it stayed in or when it stayed out because I disagreed with beta readers. Okay. When you're getting ready to release a new title, like, say, on this case, you know, December 18th of next month, do you run any sort of specials on your previous titles just to try and ramp up, you know, interest in your books? If it's a series, I will, I will often, uh, I'll drop up like, I will. Let's see. If it's a series, I will either drop, do a price drop on one of the earlier books. Sometimes as a permanent price drop. When I when I release the second book in the uh, sci-fi series is when I made the first book in the sci-fi series free. Uh, and I've also tried dropping an earlier book to 99 cents. So I've done either temporary or permanent price drops on earlier books. And I try to, I try to like this most recent one, the next book coming out is uh, in the sci-fi series. So last month or, yeah, last month I ran a book bub ad on the first book in the series. And I was like, you know, people are going to get it, you know, about 10% of them are going to read it. And then they'll finish and they'll buy the second one. And then right about when the pre-order goes live, they might be looking for the third one. So, uh, I've tried. I've tried doing like trickle down advertising on on later uh, series ones. As for stuff that's not in the series, uh, um, I I can't do an awful lot. But I, I I will I'll just sort of talk it up and I'll talk about what it's related to and people who like that might like this. So not really uh, uh, um, promotions in that way. Just promoting. Do you find that it works? I have found. Well, I've done pre-orders twice. Once on every place but Amazon and once on every place. And I have found that doing the... Both of them were part of a series, so I was able to do pre-order promotion. Definitely the BookBub ad leading into the, the, the second book and then onward into the, the pre-order third book, much bigger response than anything I've done before. So I would say it's fairly definitive that if you can if you can do a, a little bit of a rev up on your earlier books in a series, then you can see a lot more pre-order and, and just pre -per, you know pre-release buzz on the later book in the series. So I definitely recommend it. Okay, when you get ready to release one of your books, there, what type of ads do you typically run nowadays? Like for one of your like this next one, what do you plan on doing? Uh, this next one, I'm going to do on release day. I'm going to do a Facebook a promoted post. Uh, I, I f that'll hit like 10,000 people, I think. Well, I don't know. It changes every time because it depends on how many uh, uh, fans you have at the time, and it's like friends of friends. So I guess last one hit around 10,000 people, I guess. And that's a pretty good punch. And not, you know, there's not going to be a huge buy-through rate, but it's going to put it at the very least on all of your fans' dashboards as opposed to just a select portion of your fans' da dashboards. So I'm definitely going to do a promoted post. I don't do a tremendous amount of other advertising. BookBub is not a possibility for a new release because you need to have a certain number of reviews. There's a, a, a kind of a, a loose formula they use, I imagine, to decide if it's good enough. And part of it is reviews, and you can't have reviews on a pre-order unless you're special. Amazon will let you have reviews again if you're one of their favorite sons. But uh, so BookBub's not an option. So I probably won't be doing an awful lot of paid advertising beyond the promoted post. But I will be doing like I have. 
a lot of social presences, and I'm going to sort of cycle through them a few times and do my, my newsletter release to try to just sort of spread out. I try to do sort of a launch week. I, my previous book release, my previous book release that I did, like my previous major book release, uh, I actually did a promoted um, a blog tour, and it was a, it was a week-long blog tour. So I try to spread things out, but usually for a book release, my only paid ad is going to be a promoted post. And is this what you did? For, I say this is what you did for the last one. The last one was the blog uh, blog posting thing, because you yeah. typically do when you do a release like a, a paid Facebook ad. Yeah, it's more or less one of my like go-to things for a book release is the paid Facebook ad because it's very very simple. I was going to do the Facebook post anyway, but this is a little click on it and give them forty dollars or however much it's going to take. So it just basically ease and uh, and speed. Like there's this Facebook promoted posts are right away. It's you're done. And a lot of the other stuff needs lead in. And I find that I'm very bad at, at at setting up stuff for a specific date that's not automatic. So uh, yeah, it's really my go-to thing is the Facebook promoted post. And the rest of it is sort of advertising or methodology du jour is to see what works. If you don't mind me asking, how much does those Facebook promoted posts typically run you? Uh, it, ch it changes over time and over how many people it's going to reach. It used to be 15 bucks. I think the last one I ran was $30. And it's, well, I think I might have it open here. Let's see what it would tell me, right? This is real time information, everybody. <laughs> uh, if I wanted to promote my most recent post, which has got a link in it, wants sixty dollars. Oh, I'm getting popular. And it says it would reach up to eighteen thousand people. Nice. So I have thirteen hundred and thirty four likes and it costs me sixty dollars to boost a post. And it scales with how many people are on your list. So smaller like list is gonna hit uh, cost less. Good to know. Here's a question for you. Have you ever had a launch and go so horribly that you ended up learning what not to do for the next time? I've I've had some uh, <laughs> I've had some uh, some launches that were duds. Uh, I wrote a book again. It's hard to sell a book that's. I mean, it's hard to sell a lot of copies of a book that's in a genre that nobody knows about, like superhero satire. So I had that book launch, which was on April Fool's Day, which also a fantastic idea is to launch it on a day that most people are making jokes. Uh, so that's a bad idea. Don't do that. But, uh, uh, well, I talk about the book tour, I mean, the blog tour. While the blog tour was effective and then it got me a few blog reviews because they were just, like, part of the tour, um, I didn't see a tremendous amount of purchase through because of it. So I wouldn't say that that was a bad launch when I did the blog tour, but I would say that it, the impact was minimal uh, beyond having a couple of cover blurbs I could put up if I wanted to because of the, I had actual blog reviews. But, yeah... When I did my launch of the, the, the superhero book, it was a perfect storm of people aren't going to buy this because it was a genre that nobody looks for. It was, uh, you know, goof. the cover is good, but it's goofy looking on purpose because it's satire, and that didn't work out terribly well. Um, and then I released it on a day when people are making jokes about stuff, and uh, I did not do any sort of free order or anything like that. So uh, what I got to say is, yeah... I learned not to uh, not to do a joke release. So don't do joke releases. Make 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 serious releases, and, and people will respect them. And definitely not April Fools. Not April Fools Day. That was not a great idea. I thought it was great. You know, it's satire. It's it's got it's and it's, here's the other thing. There's an inside joke on the cover. All right. People don't get an inside joke until they read the the, the, the book. So it's not going to make sense to put one on the cover. You put it on the back cover, maybe. But it was like, the, if you were to look at the cover of the, my book, The Other Eight, you would see the main character is in the background. The two main characters are in the background, and one of the very secondary characters is front and center because that's his superpower, that he's always in the right place at the right time. So while they were making the cover, he was front and center. And uh, again, sort of falls on deaf ears when they haven't been told the story yet. 
And I say the last question I have is, have you ever had any problems after releasing a brand new book getting some reviews? I mean, does that, does it, how quickly do you get your reviews after you release a new title? Um, I... I find I can get I can get like 11 reviews in a re no, you know what the magic number is nine I can get nine reviews fairly quickly uh, and beyond that unless it's one of my main series books seems like no one ever wants to review them so I've had difficulty uh, again I guess I could give real time information where um, the other eight my my sort of blooper of a of a release I think it has nine reviews now it's been out since April Fool's Day and uh, People just aren't reviewing it. Yeah, nine reviews on that one. Free Wrench, which was reasonably well promoted and well liked, has only got uh, 14 reviews, and that's been out since July. So I have a little bit of difficulty getting reviews. I don't solicit them as, as aggressively as I might. I I mention them in the back in the in the uh, the author's note, but I have a little bit of difficulty getting people to review anything that's not either in my main sci-fi or my main fantasy. I guess it's because. Um, Fewer of my fans, like devoted fans, are reading my side stuff. So this is just sort of random people who are reading this and therefore are less inclined to do me a favor. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, that's what I've got uh, all finished up. So, Joe, you're up for uh, interviewing Lindsay. Yep. And uh, my, my interview list is kind of cheating because Lindsay did a fairly substantial post about this, so I'm basically going to be convincing her to, to summarize that for everybody, but Lindsay, uh, uh, I know that you recently did a pretty large-scale experiment involving a pen name, and uh, I'm going to ask a couple questions about that. My first one is, was this an entirely from-scratch launch, or did you try to carry over any of your previous readership? All right, yeah, I'll try to be, I think I was pretty articulate in the blog post. I have a hard time doing that in real time. Writing is so much easier. But, um, no, for the pen name experiment, it was actually, I've been kind of eyeballing this, this sort of subgenre for a long time. It's also in science fiction and fantasy. I haven't gone public with the name or anything yet, but uh, some people did figure it out after I published that post. But, um, yeah, it's just something, I, I've read a lot of books in it, and it's, largely ignored by the traditional publishers, so there's a lot of substandard books in it. <laughs> but it's sort of a hun hungry market, so I might as well just say it's a science fiction romance. And um, it's it's under romance, like the romance categories, and then like slash science fiction, rather than being under science fiction and there being a slash romance category. Um, but mine's sort of a space opera, so I'm, I'm in those categories too. But um, no, I didn't tell anybody about it except for a couple beta readers, and uh, I actually asked my editor. I was a little like, do you mind editing something with some more descriptive, detailed, romance-y type of things? <laughs> I was a little embarrassed to uh, ask her about that, because most of my stuff's pretty uh, PG-13. Um, but so those are the only people that knew about it, and um, I knew that I wouldn't have any fans or anything going in. I, I decided to not tell people sort of so I could screw around and not worry about anybody's reaction and also because a lot of times I hear people say well you guys started four years ago and you have a fan base so it's way easier now to, to publish than it is for someone just getting started today and I knew that was yes it's 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 yeah it's easier then there's less competition but there were less people with Kindles too so it's mm, you know and I've seen people hit it out of the ballpark that started like a year ago or even this year so I think it's probably rarer now. It's harder to really knock it out of the park, or you know. But not who's going to do that anyway. Most of us we're happy if we like sell ten books on the the launch week. If you're especially if you're starting out as a new author. But so the answer to your question is nobody knew about it, and uh, I gave my beta readers copies so they didn't go out and buy it. So nobody was buying it that uh, before. Nobody knew to buy it basically. All right. That's that's uh, just from, uh, knowing from the post what your numbers are, and we'll talk that, about that a little bit. Um, I, I'm spectacularly impressed uh, at what you were able to achieve with with essentially an unknown author starting point. Um, what kind of groundwork did you do before release? Well, the first thing I, I knew right away it was going to be hard with just one book. So I said, you know what, I'm going to write three books before I even publish anything. And that was kind of based on, I mean, common sense, just because I know that it's easier if you can make the first one free or 99 cents to get people to try a series. But also, I think, I uh, heard it through the grapevine, I think it was on Hugh Howie's blog, that uh, Liliana Hart had some method. She's a rom romance writer. 
she her method was like publish five books to start with right out of the blocks and then publish one each month after that and you can be like full time in no time uh, Romance is different than uh, science fiction and fantasy, of course. That's such a huge uh, genre, like contemporary romance, and I think historical romance does really well. And science fiction romance is, uh, you know, it's got potential. <laughs> it's, it takes a special reader to want spaceships and romance in the same sh same uh, story, but uh, it's it's probably not one of those huge uh, genres. But it's, you know, I, I talked about in my post. It's easier to uh, maybe become the big fish in the small pond kind of thing when you're getting started right now. But, uh, so that I, d I knew I wasn't going to be able to publish five books to start out with and have one one a month after that. Uh, a lot of those people that are able to do that are either really fast writers, uh, but a lot of them have a backlist when they're coming in, uh, or they just they were trying to sell books for a long time to agents, so they have a few in the trunk. And of course, at the same time, I'm writing my regular books, so I thought three was a respectable goal, and so I wrote the first three rough drafts. You know, and then my editor was busy with my other stuff too. I practically keep her employed full time. So, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, basically I had the first two ready in October, and that's kind of what I launched with. Uh, and then the third one I just launched a little over a week ago. So uh, in the first month, uh, first thing I did is put the first one out there for 99 cents, and a few people did buy it. Uh, I have no idea how people find books just randomly, but I think it helped that it was a full novel and it was only 99 cents. Uh, I don't know how broad, the, how much this is in sci-fi and fantasy as a whole right now, but like in the romance genres, there seems to be a lot of uh, people doing like little serials, little like 90-page novellas and things, and like where book one or whatever is just to hook you in, and then you got to go pay. So by having an inexpensive book one that was a full 90,000-word novel, you know, I think that's attractive to people. And I would say that... Uh, uh, oh, after about five days, I was trying right from the beginning to make it perma-free. I put it up at Smashwords and Barnes and Noble, you know, threw Smashwords to the other sites and made it free. And I was just hoping that somewhere along the line, Amazon would make it free. Uh, for people who are trying to do that, I believe that the more popular a book is, it tends to be the more the more quickly it gets made price matched or made free. Uh, I've noticed that people that don't have really any sales at all really can sometimes have a long time or not. It's just, I think they have bots kind of like the way Google does, goes out and searches all the sites and indexes and makes notes of what's fresh and they're probably spying on their competition and making notes of what's free or cheaper or whatever. So it's a little chance. Uh, I was lucky that the they made the, fir the first book perma-free at the same time pretty much as I launched the second about a week later. So right away I'd, I'd, I'd sold like 70 copies at 99 cents and that was from doing a couple by chance, and then I did a couple of those Fiverr guys, BK Knights, and there's another site, I think they're off Fiverr now, Genre Pulse. So they were $5 ads, and I think those each sold maybe 8 or 10 copies, and it was enough to get in the top 100 of that category, which is, uh, that's another reason why a smaller category can be more appealing, because there's no way in epic fantasy that that would get you there. I think right now it takes about maybe a 10,000 sales ranking to get into the 100th spot in a in the science fiction romance category. So, I don't know, I think I've babbled on. I forgot what the original question was, so did I answer was, it? <laughs> yeah, oh, you answered. That was, that was, the question was about groundwork for pre-launch, and, and th you did an awful lot of groundwork for your pre-launch on that one. So, uh, And uh, my next question was going to be about whether or not there was anything unique about this launch for you, and it, this, you did a multi-book launch. Uh, you, had you ever launched a new series with more than one book? I had not, and I, I will say, actually, going back to the last question I, I talked about in my blog post, I should mention here that I actually did try to do some things uh, to get readers and reviewers before I launched the book. I tried Wattpad. I put the whole novel, the whole first novel up on there, and I broke it up into small little chunks, so they're like 50 chapters, <laughs> even though there's like 13 or 15 chapters in the book, just hoping that people would stumble across it. But um, one problem I had with is because it's R-rated, and on Wattpad, you have to click a special box to uh, to even see the R-rated stuff. And I'm guessing you probably also had to, whenever you gave them your date of birth, you have to be at least 18 or something like that. And uh, I know from an interview I listened to with some uh, with a Wattpad lady on the Creative Pen podcast that there is a over 20 audience that that likes more adult content, but they don't make it real easy to find on Wattpad. I think you know they're uh, they know that like two-thirds of their audience is under 18. And so I didn't really 
you know, I've had some people follow along, but my original goal in posting there was hoping I'd find some reviewers so that I could just say, hey, you read the whole thing, would you mind posting a review? But I, I had a few comments, but nobody really seemed to uh, want to chit-chat or really be into that, in so I didn't email anybody after that. So I don't know that it was a waste of time, but it, it was kind of a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I made a forum, too, a couple of forum uh, personalities for my, my person, my uh, pen name. In the romance uh, self-publishing forum, Romance Divas, I'm on there now, and I guess that was the only one I did. And I had this thought, well, you know, I'll have it in my signature file there, and maybe people will go check it out. And all this ended up being like two people signed up for my mailing list or for the pen names mailing list. I knew one of them. I, I was kind of stoked that I didn't know one of them. <laughs> but I, I didn't even send out an email when I launched the first two books. I was like, there's no point. So basically, the perma free and uh, just getting some sales early on at 99 cents, I think, uh, is pretty much what helped. All right. Um, now, let's talk about the success of your launch. Were you happy with the success of, of this launch? Like, was it a, a successful experiment? And how did it stack up to some of your other recent launches? Oh, wait. I, I skipped your last question. <laughs> right. I totally uh, avoided you answer about. by jumping back. Um, so let me answer that real quick, because uh, okay. you know people out walking their dogs, they need they need more to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> but no, as myself, I've never I'm writing faster now than I ever have before. Uh, just this last year, I've really written a lot. So I've never really been in the position before where I could just oh I'm just gonna write three books in advance. That's a piece of cake. And uh, <laughs> granted, it wasn't a piece of cake either with with uh, the pen name. I that was over the summer. I did the rough drafts, and I was doing other stuff at the same time. So it took a while before I was ready to to launch the first one. But I had seen that with my own stuff, uh, with my steampunk series that I, I launched last April, March, something like that. Uh, the first one is called Balanced on the Blade's Edge, and that was my uh, incidentally my first book with some naughty bits in it. Uh, and I got mixed reviews uh, from longtime readers, so that was a big reason of why. I, that was another reason why I switched off and did the pen name. But I launched that one in, I think, March or April, and it, it actually did pretty well in uh, Steampunk, and I think it was because, like I said, that's a less competitive genre than I usually just am in epic fantasy, and that's a beast. And so I decided to go ahead and write a second one right away, uh, even though I hadn't made plans to make it a series. Uh, but I got the second one out at the end of May, and the third one out at the uh, beginning of July. So that was almost kind of the same thing where you're having something every six weeks or so. And I really, uh, I did have a good good success with that for that series, at least for the first few months. And then I switched to writing something else, and it's since fallen off. So now it's been like six months since I published the third one. And I've got the fourth one almost ready to go, so we'll see if I can kind of run some ads and liven things up a bit. But uh, I did, for one for a little while, I had the top three spots in Steampunk with those three books. Yeah, that was right around when I released my steampunk book. I remember that very clearly. <laughs> <laughs> little uh, irritation. <laughs> cool. You know, like at least I knew the per. Like uh, you, you can see people dominate sections sometimes, and it's like Jim Butcher has a top eighteen books out of twenty. I'm like, all right, fine. But at least this was like, ah, oh, I know her. She's nice. She deserves it. <laughs> but I do. I definitely think that is a perk of being able to release books pretty rapidly and uh catch people while they're interested in remembering your name. So, uh, you know, I know not everybody's going to write a book every month, but it, it is something to think about. Maybe it is, especially if you're a new author and you're doing a series, uh, maybe wait until you have two ready to go. And uh, I definitely found, even with two, that I could get some momentum on that second book. And uh, I should add that um, with this series, I'm making them open-ended. So they all take place on the same spaceship with the same crew, but uh, there's not, like... It's not, the it's not the same heroes in each story. So I was a little worried. I was like, would people read the perma-free and then they screw it? Because the people introduced in book two weren't even in book one. So, but uh, some people, I think probably uh, I got less people buying through like that. But uh, some people have obviously gone on to buy the second one. And um, one of the perks I'm looking forward to with uh, this kind of concept is that I think I can uh, advertise later books in the series pretty easily. Uh, like with my Emperor's Edge stuff, I got to book seven, and I'm like, there's no point in advertising this because people will be totally lost if they haven't read the first six books. So uh, this will be a different kind of series and interesting for me to try out. 
Yeah, I, I, that's, that's something I've noticed with with uh, Series 2. I've attempted... I, I am not great at doing standalones. Even the stuff that was intended to be standalone always reads like a pilot. So uh, I, I've, I've tried doing multiple entry points as my method to get people in like, well, you can start from here, here, or here, and you'll sort of catch on. But uh, all right, so that... that Covers the the leapfrog question, and now success of the launch. You, you talked a bit about it, but like, how do you, do you feel like your your methods were were highly successful? And you know, we'll just we'll, we'll sort of interleave this with the next question. I know that you used uh, Kindle Select for this, and you haven't used that in the past. Uh, how do, how much do you think it imp it uh, contributed to the success of this launch? All right. Yeah, I'm very happy with the the success, and especially now that I've hit the 30 day mark on a with the book two, and it's still selling at the same place as it was for um, you know it's about 16. It's kind of bouncing back and forth between like 1500 and 2000 sales ranking right now, and I keep waiting for that to fall off because everybody talks about the 30 day cliff, and I've kind of seen that with other titles. But I think if you're able to get up into like the top 20 of a even if it's a smaller, you know. Yeah, I love science fiction because there's actually so many sub 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 genres. <laughs> like you can, I don't know what is it, it's something like space opera or military sci-fi, and then it further divides into like space fleet or space marines. Like, what the heck is the difference between those two things? I don't know, but it's two different places where you can possibly show up in a chart. So, yay! But so I think if you can get in the top 20, you might be able to stick for a little while, especially if you just kind of had steady, consistent sales. Uh, I put out the third book just over a week ago, and it's been as high as 7.15 in the store. And I'm going to talk about Kindle Select, because, yeah, that has played a big role. Um, I, with all my normal books, I've never touched it, because, um, yeah, I started publishing in 2010 also, and uh, it wasn't a thing back then. So I have readers that follow me on Barnes and & Noble and Kobo and iPad, and I don't want the irate emails of, uh, what do you mean your book's not available on the stores where we buy it, so and I totally get that. I feel like I've got readers in those places, and I want to be loyal to them. But it is frustrating when you see KDP Select over here, and you see all these advantages that people have been getting. You know, first there was a uh, whatever. If you made it free for two days, it jumped up high on the paid charts when you came back in, and then they squashed that. But then they added the Kindle countdown, and you know, you could get uh, sell it at 99 cents during that time and still get the 70% royalty and you know, now we've got Kindle Unlimited, so as I finally would depend them, I'm going to try this stuff because, you know, nobody knew who the author was and nobody was waiting for those books, so why not? And I haven't done any of the uh, countdowns or anything like that yet. Uh, the books have been selling well enough at 3.99 that I've just, you know, I'll save it for later, I guess. But uh, just the fact that the Kindle Unlimited thing is happening, I believe that has really been key in why these books were able to climb the charts. Uh, right now, people probably know that basically a borrow counts for just as much as a sale as far as uh, affecting sales ranking. And, you know, it's funny, I hear people complain about borrow stealing sales, but I think a borrow is going to be a lot easier to come by than a $4 book purchase, especially if somebody's just chanting across you and hasn't read the other books. Um, I've noticed that in the third book, I have a, a better ratio, more sales than borrows. Uh, so I think people are following along and actually wanting to own a copy at that point, some people. But uh, with the second book, it's about 50-50. I think there's actually more borrows and sales at this point. Whoops. <laughs> Doggy visitor. But um, And it's just because those borrows, I think, are easier to come by. It really helps you. If you are able to jump into the top 100 and get some visibility, it can only help you, you know, like I said, it's, so I feel that it's a huge advantage right now to be in uh, Kindle Unlimited and uh, KDP Select. I'm not, am I bitter about this? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to take advantage of it with the pen name, but yeah, with the other stuff, because I, I, like a lot of authors, I've seen my sales ranking drop quite a bit on my regular books. Um, and it's not necessarily that the sales are way down, but the sales ranking's down and they're off the charts and... You know, I haven't had a new release for a little while either, so that affects it. But, yeah, so I would say now if you're a new author, take advantage of it. Sign up for KDP Select. Um, it's not like a easy button necessarily, but if you can make those initial sales that you need to get into the top 100 and maybe climb a little, it can definitely help you. Um, and if, if you're way out of the top 100 in your category, then 
you know, I've heard from people that it really doesn't help at all. It's like big whoop, you got two borrows this month or, you know, so you need to kind of work it in a way that you can actually hopefully get some visibility. And, and that's, again, where I think the smaller categories are, it's easier to stand out as a new author. Yeah. It, on the subject of borrows, stealing sales, it seems kind of an odd opinion to have because it's like you would put your book, you would put your book on sale as a promotion and make less money from that book, but sell more books. Then why wouldn't you want like it's the same thing, a borrow as opposed to a sale? Uh, so it's an unusual position to have, I think. But back to the questions: um, Are you planning to drop the books out of KDP Select and, and make them more widely available after the, the 90-day period? That is uh, my original plan, at least uh, I thought I'd put all new releases into KDP Select as long as Kindle Unlimited is going and it's beneficial to do so and then cycle them out after 90 days and try to get a readership elsewhere. Uh, mostly I feel I should do that because I made the first book perma-free and it's out there elsewhere and you know I've had a couple people email and say, um, book two? Is, is there a book two? Like, yes, but uh, it's only on Amazon, sorry. <laughs> Um, but we'll see because actually uh, it's doing well enough. Let's see, it, it's November 25th, and between the two books, there's been over a thousand borrows this month. So I'm thinking, I've seen the charts of what uh, what it takes to get what is it KDP All Stars or it's something like that. It's crazy. They they give extra money to the people that are doing really well with borrows, and uh, I think it's something like four thousand borrows was last month was the 99th place person, and I, so I was kind of like, gosh. And that person got five thousand dollars. You know, <laughs> if I had a few more books in there and they they were doing this well, that could be potentially something you could reach. But I don't know. I, my inclination is to go wide eventually with it. Yeah, I, I, that would be my. If I was to ever try this, I'd probably just do the ninety day uh, limited exclusivity as well. But. You know, limited exclusivity for a launch is probably uh, you would say a, a a valid launch strategy. Yeah, I definitely think that if it can help you out and get you more readers overall, you know, why not take advantage of it? I'll actually be launching a new series under my regular name uh, in January or February, and boy, am I debating. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's related to my Emperor's Ed series. It's in the same world, so I know a lot of readers would cross over. But I'm thinking, wow, maybe I should put it 90 days on Amazon first, and uh, especially if I did a launch at 99 cents uh, or 2.99, then the borrow. I think you make 1.33 or something right now on a borrow. That'd actually be an improvement if somebody borrowed a 99 cent book. You know, that'd be like way more than you usually get. And uh, it's interesting. I listened to a an interview with Hugh Howie from this summer, and I'm not sure if his p opinion is still the same. But at the time, he was kind of saying, "Well, if you can." Uh, if by being in KDP Select and being exclusive on Amazon, you actually end up getting more readers than you would by being on the other five places, then you know maybe you got to think about that. Uh, his analogy was like, do you want to sell uh, a million books in Indiana or ten thousand books worldwide? And I was like, well, yeah, that's I want some more books. <laughs> so um, I just. Uh, you know, I hate the. I personally don't like the idea of being exclusive with Amazon. But I think when you're a new author, or you're really trying to get some gain some traction. It's right now KDP Select has some tools that can help you reach more people potentially and uh, gain a gain more readers. So you think being a, a brand new author, it's best to start out with the KDP Select versus an established author releasing a new new title. You're like probably shouldn't, lest you <laughs> irritate the fans. Right. I mean, and it all depends on what your relationship is. If you have a fans that you're really uh, email you and are looking forward to and stuff, and uh, just uh, you know, it's it's up to everybody else. But yeah, as a new author, why not? I mean, or if you're not really selling that well, I you know, I hear from people all the time that uh, they just don't they don't sell. They've been on Kobo for three years or whatever, or through Smashwords, and they've never really gained any traction on the other sites. You know, I found that uh, a perma free can definitely help gain traction on the other sites, but um, that's just been my experience. Not everybody has that experience or has something they want to make free. So I guess right now, uh, as I'm right, saying this in November of 2014, you know, it seems like worth trying. A lot of this is just experimenting and figuring out what works and trying a bunch of different things, and you never really know what, what will help you uh, help you launch a book and get more sales. 
Yep. Um, and I guess this is sort of the answer to this question is sort of spread out across all of your answers, but uh, what aspects of this strategy do you think are generally applicable to people with a more conventional launch, like not a multi-book launch? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, I think by being in the small category, I think I would have sold books anyway because I was selling, uh, you know, I would say make the first one 99 cents for a while, even if that's not going to be your regular price. Uh, if you are in KDB Select, you can do the Kindle countdown, and uh, you can choose to make it lower the price, or you can choose to make it free for five days in a quarter. So I, I've actually heard from other people that when they just have one book, like like you were saying, that they will go ahead and launch it right off the bat and make it free for a couple of days in order to try to get some reviews. And um, I will say right now I have over 50 reviews on the first two books, and it's not because I'm so special and people love me. It's I basically told them in the back of the book, and I got this from Trish McCollin on the uh, self-publishing roundtable. I just said, hey, show me a link to one of my books. Show me that you are a proven reviewer, and I'll send you a book. And uh, so that seems like a good policy until you get uh, some reviews. And uh, because you're making them show you a link, you know, I, I always know that when you send out review copies, you know, a lot of people don't end up doing anything with them. So this was a, and, and because I had the free one, they didn't have to buy anything to get that. So just uh, re review copies to anybody, but uh, like I said, I, I think it's good to ask them to show you the money, show you the reviews. <laughs> yeah, bribery is, is always a valid option. <laughs> yeah, that would definitely be good for an established author creating a brand new series, as you were saying, and saying, okay, well, you know, if you try this, show me that you made a review, and I'll give you a free copy of something or other there. But I think it's yeah. a good idea. And it's a fine line because you're not supposed to, in the Amazon terms of service, you're not supposed to give them anything except a review copy. You can't enter them in contests or promise to send them to Vegas if they're the thousands reviewer or anything like that. So, you know, I, I really don't, you know, like basically they have to have reviewed one of my books, so obviously there has to be to get the next one, but I'm only giving them the second book in exchange for a review. So it's, I hope it's, you know, it's all, everybody has to find their line and find what's cool with them, and I just think that it's a, it's a good way to make sure they're actually going to review the book and I, I never have any problem giving away free books for, in exchange for review, review, especially when you're just getting started. Likewise. And that, that more or less wraps up uh, my questions, and we're pretty much at the end of the hour, but I got, this is sort of a, I don't know, I was thinking about this over the course of the conversation, I thought I'd bring it up here. 90 days is how long you uh, have to be in select. It's a 90-day chunk of time before you can opt out, right? Right. You can, you can also pre-order for three months, which is 90 days. I would have to look through the terms of service, but can you be in select only during a pre-order period and then go wide as soon as you release? Ooh, good question. This is something I, I'll, I'd wager to say it's going to be 90 days from the publication of the book, but it would be interesting to see if you could actually pull that weird little stunt. Yeah, I do not know the answer to that. I haven't tried to pre-order yet because I never have cover art and everything ready yeah. that far in advance. So, but that that would be interesting. Yeah, I'll have to. I guarantee I'm gonna go go through and like it'll be like two words into the term of service. So, oh yeah, 90 days from the publication of the book. Oh, okay, never mind. But it'd be funny if that was a loophole at this current time. Yeah, that'd be uh, interesting if you. Although I could actually see doing the other way where you'd want to be wide everywhere first to please your regular readers for like a week or two and then yanking everything and then putting it in KDB Select. Yeah, that's interesting too because it gives you the whole artificial, it's like it's like a limited time deal for everybody else for a little while. Like get it while it lasts because it's going exclusive starting, you know, July 3rd. So yeah. you, you can make it work really in either, in either direction I suppose. But it's, it's, it's toying with your audience which is not always the safest thing to do. <laughs> right. I, I think this summer, um, Rachel Aaron, who wrote the 2K to 10K book, and she's got a fantasy series and a sci-fi series, I was reading on her blog post how uh, she had much more impressive launch than I had. <laughs> of course, she had a fan base already, but she, this was her first self-published title. And um, she, she put it out everywhere first, and then I think for like a month, and decided at that point, I don't know if she'd always planned to try KDP Select, but she then put it in KDP Select, and it already had some momentum on Amazon because she's an established author. It's a great cover, great-looking book, uh, Urban Fantasy, Nice Dragons Finish Last, I think it is. 
in my to be to read pile, to be read pile. But um, and then she her, she really took off after she put it in select, and it ended up. And I can see why, because like I was saying, the borrowers count as sales. But so, yeah. <laughs> so that's something I've been thinking about too. I guess we'll have to revisit this in a couple of months after we all launch our next book and see what yeah. we ended up doing. That, that, that'll actually be an interesting thing to do, like a six-month recap of this episode. We're like, well, we all did our releases. Here's what worked and here's what didn't. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Either that or we could have some cool guests on by then. And yeah, that'd, that'd be, nice. be more interesting. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that whole thing That whole thing as like a five-second recap at the beginning. What about you? Oh, I tanked. What about you? Oh, I did well. All right, on to our guest. All right. Well, Mr. Howie. <laughs> Uh, all right, and I think that takes us to the end of our show. So uh, thanks for everybody for for sharing your thoughts, and I guess we'll all, we'll see you all next time. All right, thanks for listening, people. Bye bye. Take it easy. Happy reading.